Pushing Ham Production. Today's build is going to be based off of this book here called Fighting the Slave Trade. The points of interest are going to be the methods used to resist the Atlantic slave trade, the African resistance to the internal slave trade, the African resistance to the external slave trade, the decentralized coastal West African revolts, and slave ship revolts. By decentralized coastal West African peoples, I mean those are the peoples who decided not to be a part of the kingdoms or the empires that were in existence in West Africa and migrated to the coast by the water of West Africa. This will now take us to a point in history that is dealing with the age of discovery for the Europeans, specifically with the Portuguese in which they wanted to obtain gold and other items in the unknown world to them. Also to find out new trade routes to seek resources for the empire. What prompts the age of discovery is something called the Crusades. The Crusades are dealing with the reconquest of the lands that are said to belong to the Christians and the war between Islam and Christianity. And then with this crusade, they finally beat the Moors in a battle for a trade post on the island of Suetar in 1415. This sets off the age of discovery. Upon the Europeans traveling on the western coast of Africa, they come to a place that they named Rio de Oro, which means the rivers of gold because they were searching for gold. Now, the Portuguese, once they arrived, began slave raids and they enslaved who they called Moorish Berbers and black prisoners of war. They did so in the knowledge that their actions were in accordance with the laws of war prevailing in Christian Europe. 
Originally, all prisoners of war could be enslaved. But by the 13th century, there was a general European consensus that Christians could enslave only infidels provided that the infidels have not been taken in a just war. Generally, however, war against the infidel appears such a good cause that a sovereign prince was deemed competent to attack states ruled by unbelievers whenever he pleased. The Portuguese kings evidently believed they had sufficient authority to declare war on infidels because they launched the first raid on Mauritania in 1441. This will set off the first forms of African resistance to the slave trade. The African resistance to kidnapping in West Africa in the 1400s goes as the chronicle of the discovery and the conquest of Guinea speaks from the chronicle of Zuara. So the Moors have the same thought that our men had and being more carefully on the watch had arranged three ambushes as well as they could behind some duns located there. There they waited until they saw that our men were near. Then the Moors, seeing they were much more numerous than our men, sprung their trap and advanced strongly against them. However, at last our men saw the great danger they were in and the need to retire and began to retreat. The others who were still on the shore waited to get into the boat to Goncavo Pancho's ship, but found themselves in extreme danger because although it had the lightest load, it was large and could not be launched, remaining stuck on the dry land because the tide was not in the last quarter of its ebb. So some of the men who knew how to swim, seeing danger so near at hand, threw themselves into the water and saved their lives by swimming. Others who did not know that art or forced to prepare themselves to meet their fate, and they met a sad death. Seven perished. This is a form of African resistance to the kidnapping in West Africa in the 1400s. When it speaks about Moors, this is the concept that the Portuguese had on black people. It was synonymous with the word black. The term more was also used by the Portuguese for a political mean. We are learned from the book African Kings and Black Slaves, Sovereignty and Dispossession in the Early Modern Atlantic. As the Portuguese encountered more of Guinea's inhabitants, the terms Black Moors, Black Ethiopes, Guineas, and Negroes or the descriptive terms to which a religious signifier was appended, such as Moors who were Gentiles and pagans, gradually constituted the rootless and sovereignless, and in many cases, simply slaves. By linking Portugal's activities in Guinea with the conquest of Ciara, the impetile stress how spiritual imperatives motivated exploration along the Atlantic coast, in his diplomatic entreaty, impotent Henrique minimized the commercial incentive and fashioned the toils of the conquest into a just war under the banner of a Christian crusade. So basically what this is saying is the term war was linked with their crusades and justified their slavery. There are numerous historical developments that shape the political or social context of enslavement and resistance to enslavement in the 18th and 19th centuries. Here, I will focus on the internal slave trade, the rise of the relatively powerful states like Futa Jalon and Moriah. Futa elite decided to launch a jihad in the 1700s after the lead of Futo Toro and Futo Bundo in Senegal. 
even though it was successful in converting many people to Islam, the jihad also became a justification for the enslavement of the non-Islamic peoples in the area. So here you'll see Futa Julan, the Islamic State and their spread. We'll be looking at Senegal and the Guinea coast on the left. As the Iman of Futa Julon put it in a letter to the governor of Sierra Leone in 1810, they are cappers and they are like ass or like cattle. They know not the rights of God and still less the rights of men. And in our parts, you are not sold any man who knows the God of truth, the people whom men used to sell until your hands do not acknowledge the religion of Moses peace be upon him, nor the religion. So I quoted this so we can see this Iman from the region that we was looking at, Futsa Julan, speaking to a governor in Sierra Leone so we can understand what type of people we are dealing with. These are Africans. So now we are dealing with the internal slave trading African societies. Here are some Africans who dealt with the internal slave trade. The tribes are the Fula, the Mandingo, and the Soso, also called Suso societies, were heavily dependent on the slave trade and enslaved labor for local food production. The slaveholding elite separated their bonded population into recently enslaved and housed enslaved. By the late 18th century, as the Atlantic slave trade declined, the slaveholders in the Upper Guinea Coast created a spatial separation between the free population and ordinary slaves. They placed the later in separate villages called Rungdi and Fula, Daka and Susu and John Kunda and Mandingo. Based off the expansion of this slave raiding empire, we are now at the Africans' resistance against the Fula. In 1756, the enslaved population of Fula Jolan rose against the slave owning class and declared themselves free and migrated northwest toward Futa Bundu. They built a well fortified settlement called Kandia which was repeatedly attacked by the Pula and their allies. James Watt, a British embassy to the army, cites two other rebellions against the Futa Jalan elite during his visit to Timbo in 1794. He noted the extensive destruction caused by the revolt, his brutal repression, and the execution of 30 men among the leaders. A full-scale rebellion called the Mandingo Rebellion from 1785 to 1796 on the coast of West Africa occurred due to the slave trading empire. We read, it was one of the largest, most protracted anti-slavery rebellions and it affected the entire Upper Guinea coast. It involved a group of Temni, Baga, and Bulun people and was directed against the Mandingo ruling and slave owning Eli and Moria. The enslaved represented 70 to 80 percent of Moria's population by the 1770s and produced most of the rice, the state's major commodity. The Moria elite had their plantation slaves in villages that rapidly multiplied. The Moria Eli held their plantation slaves in villages that rapidly multiplied within 50 years. One ruler, Fendi Mudu Dembuya, owned up to nine villages reportedly producing about 100 tons of rice and 100 tons of salt annually. The slaveholders usually worked new captives on their rice plantation before selling them off to the Europeans on the coast. The rebels had a number of leaders, but only two, Mambi and Densagi, are identified in the available sources. 
The rebellion which affected the entire Northern River region involved from six to 800 people residing in the slave villages. They torched the rice fields, the state's economic mainstay. Many rebels took refuge at Yankoro, Kani, and Funku in Susu country, located on the foothills of the mountain ranges from where the Kalantine Great River rises. Yankuguro was easily defensible. The insurgents further fortified the town with 12 foot high mud walls and three large security towers. They increased the numbers by recruiting and providing refuge for other enslaved men and women and also attracted social freemen. So here you have a rebellion and now we're talking about maroonage, which means runaway slaves in West Africa and fighting against this internal slave trade. When the conflict between the Mora rulers and the Susu abated, the slaveholding classes resumed their offensive against the Yangakuri and the other Maroon communities. The way laid raided, captured, and sold into slavery all the fugitives they could. In response, the rebels organized themselves and attacked Moria, Melakori, Bararia, Kisi, and other Mandingo polities. They also captured and sold several members of the ruling elite of these territories. The tide turned against the insurgents when the Soso and the Mandingo reached the truce. The Susu Mandingo Alliance, supported by the European mercenary Thomas Ram, attacked the rebel settlements with heavy armaments in the rainy season of 1795. They destroyed the smaller ones, killed most of their inhabitants, and sold the rest into slavery. The enslaved and the free Soso who had joined them fought courageously for a common cause. They refused to surrender and choose and chose to starve themselves to death rather than come living to the enemy. Under the leadership of Densagi, Mambi, and others, they inflicted heavy casualties on the Soso Mandingo Alliance. The rebels were eventually defeated when Densagi was betrayed and captured in an attempt to replenish the rebels' military supplies. So, well, we saw how Islam was used as a tool and a negative aspect by that empire to enslave people. We are now going to look at another rebellion called the Bilal Rebellion um, from 1838 to 1872, where this individual utilized Islam to stop the slave trade. The Bilal Rebellion one of the most violent and prolonged instances of resistance of the internally enslaved. The uprising was directed mainly against the Susu ruling Eli of Kukuna Bilal, the leader of the revolt, was the son of Almani Naminia, Sheikh A. Dumbuya, the Susu king of Kukuna and of an enslaved coronical woman. Bilal's escape from slavery and his establishment of a safe haven for fugitives and sensed not only the former master, Almani Mumi, but also other major slaveholders in the region. They regarded them diversely as Muta, runaways, and Susu. His actions, especially the provision of refuge for escapees, potentially threatened the entire slaveholding complex in the region. His free community and his rigidly anti-slavery posture represented a break from a vicious, predatory culture of slavery. For more than three decades, this new Spartacus, as the British described him, resisted different Susu, Mandingo, and Temni kings who tried to curtail his growing power and support repeatedly attempts to destroy Laminia failed. 
We are now at one of my favorite tribes called the Balanta people. They are another decentralized um, coastal people in that Guinea region. Um, the origin of the Balanta is in Mali. After the Mali Empire fell, a lot of, of the ethnic groups wanted to fight for power and started their own kingdoms. The Balanta occupy the shores of Rios Giba and Mansoa for Kidum. They were pushed to these coastal regions from Muslim state invaders. Balanta resistance to Mandinka raids and attempts at establishing statehood can be found in the Mandinka word Balanto. In the language of the Mandinka, the word means those who resist indicating that Balanta were not easy to seize to incorporate into the expanding state. Uh, Balanta war tactics. The Balanta and other coastal groups resisted enslavement by exploiting the advantages offered by the region in which they live. Put simply, the coast offered more defenses and opportunities for counterattack against slave raiding armies and other enemies than did the Savannah wooded interior. The Portuguese administrator Alberto Gomez explained how the Balanta utilized the natural protection of mangrove covered areas and when they were confronted with an attack from a well organized and well armed enemy seeking captives as booty. Armed with guns and large swords, the Balanta who did not generally employ any resistance on these occasions pretended to flee. It was and is their tactic, suffering a withdrawal and going to hide in the mangrove areas on the margins of the rivers and lagoons, spreading out in the flat some distance as not to be shot by their enemies. The attackers then began to return to their lands with all of their spoils of war, organizing rapidly and aligning themselves with others in the area. The Balanta typically followed their enemies through the densely forested coastal region. At times, the Balanta waited until the attackers had almost reached their homelands before giving a few shots and making considerable noise so as to cause panic. The Balanta then engaged their enemies in combat. Yeah. Yeah. In 1777, Portuguese commander Iganico Bayo reported from Bicio that he was furious that Balanta had been adversely affecting the regional flow of slaves and other goods carried by boats along Guinea's rivers. It was not possible, he wrote, to navigate boats for those Balanta parts without some fear of the continuous robbing that they have done making captive those who navigate in the aforementioned boats. In response, Bio sent infantrymen and two vessels armed for war into Balanta territories. After these men had anchored, disembarked, and ventured some distance inland, they destroyed some men, burning nine villages, and then made a hasty retreat back to the river. Finding their vessels rendered disorderly, the infantrymen were quickly surrounded by well armed Balanta. Bio lamented that 20 men from two infantry companies were taken captive or killed. Having sent out more patriots to subdue the savage Balanta, as they will say, and having attempted a war against the decentralized people, the Portuguese found the conditions on Guinea's rivers did not improve. Balanta victorious. Viewing the regional slave trade as a threat to their communities, the Balanta continued their raids on merchant vessels, transporting captives and other goods. Such raids would tax Portuguese patients throughout the 19th and well into the 20th century, and resentment about Portuguese colonization of the coast brought renewed attacks. Thus, by garnering weapons and iron in regional markets and from Luso African merchants, Many Balanta communities, like those of other decentralized coastal societies, were not only able to stand up to the threats posed by the slaving armies of Kabahu and Casamanti, they were also able to withstand assaults by the Portuguese, 
who are attempting to profit by ensuring the smooth running of the coastal trade routes that move captives to area ports. So these Africans basically ran the Portuguese out of there. They also defeated those insane, what we would call Muslim zealots. So we are now on the slave ship revolts. There were 500 rebellions identified in the Atlantic trade, which come from the late half of the 18th century, especially during the years of peak traffic between 1751 and 1775. Data on shipboard revolt suggests that the rebellion occurred more frequently on ships with a larger than normal percentage of female slaves aboard. But the vast majority of slaves taken across the Atlantic were men, and men led the revolts and suffered higher casualties. Women seem to have played an essential supporting role. In 1720, Tamba, a chief, on the Rio Nuez, organizes people against the African and European slave traders. He obstructed their trade and executed the middleman he captured. He was caught, sold, and enslaved, but organized a revolt among the captives on the ship. It was brutally put down. Tambo was killed and his liver fed to supporters who were subsequently executed. A fooler named Old Mono rebelled on board a Danish slave ship, the Claire B. Williams, added by a local headman, aided by a local headman. They fled and established a free settlement in the mountains of Sierra Leone coast. The community became a target for slave raiders and the residents and the escapees. In 1730, captives on the American slave ship Little George escaped reached shore at Sierra Leone, received support from the local population, and apparently regained their freedom. In 1769, a revolt resulted in records that identified the African name of its leader, Eschjaria Etten, the Dutch ship Guineas had completed loading 358 slaves and was ready to begin his voyage across the Atlantic when some of the slaves overpowered the crew, cut the anchor, and set the ship adrift. But a Dutch warship in the vicinity sent two boatloads of soldiers to recapture the ship. Ten suspected leaders were taken to the Dutch West Indian Company headquarters at Elmina, the largest trading post on the West African coast. After authorities questioned three of the slaves individually, Etienne was determined to have been the leader and appears to have been the only rebel to be sentenced to death. So you hear about the Dutch West Indian Company from our rebel historian on the Africans of New York. All right, we're going to now examine how the coastal Africans utilize the um, environment as a defense mechanism against the internal slave trade that eventually leads to the external part. These people are called the Tupanu people. The Tupanu people built what you would call lake villages. The country of the Tupanu is part of the lagoon system created along the entire bite of Benin through the deep port deposit of sand by the eastward moving coastal current. It is located in the lower zone of the Soul River, a branch of the delta built up by the Wimi, the most important river in, of Benin, about 40 kilometers from the coast. Access to these various localities, whether partially or entirely, lack Kustran, which means a lake, basically village, or aqua, or aquatic living quarters. The same goes for conditions of life. Canoe is the only means of transportation from village to village and even from door to door within the same village. Tupanu Origins and Migrations The Tupanu traditionally traced the origin of their migrations through Tata, 
cradle and departure center of the Aja ethnic groups to various destinations. According to the prevalent tradition, the earliest migration from Tato led by Agasu resulted in the establishment of the related kingdoms of Savi, Udea, Alada, Abomi, and Hagboni, Porto Novo. The search for security took place within the context of violence and fear associated with the ongoing slave trade in Wadea, aka Wada, Alada, and Abomi. This violence escalated with the conquest of Diomi of Alada in 1724 and Wudea in 1727, and forced more groups, including non Aja, to move to the last Kurdistan area in order to escape slave raiders and enslavement. The trend was to continue nearly two centuries since Diomi remained committed to slave catching activities. So these guys and community built uh, villages to escape and defend themselves from slave trade. The Tupanu Defensive Strategy. The defensive and protective system built up by the Lakhurstan communities took into account their environment. Their skill as canoeists dissuaded Dahomean armies unfamiliar with the use of canoes from repeated attacks. They were also renowned for their expertise in naval warfare. Their weapons, according to George Edward, were varied and efficient. They consisted of javelin launchers, sledgehammers, swords, harpoons, and locally made and imported guns. They also had a particularly ingenious kind of Molotov cocktail. Guards were also associated with the, with the defensive system of the Tupanu against close or distant enemies. Most, if not all, the deities of the various ethnic groups were integrated into their pantheon. Thus, the cult of the Yoruba deity Shango is one of the most popular traditional religions in Ganvi, which is called not Tofinu land no more, but Ganvini. Just wanted to show some pictures of Tofinu land, or it's called Ganvi now, and you can see that these are villages that is built upon water and is based off of those Africans building their defense mechanism against the internal and external slave trade. So if you look at this, you see like a original indigenous uh, sculpture that you're looking in front, you see the little houses. And in order to get to these specific places, or get to your friend's house or to go see your girlfriend or to go to school or whatever you want to do today as it was then you have to get into a canoe so as we go into uh, another picture you get to see a little clearer and again you see an indigenous person there they're sailing and yeah this is what it looks like so through this presentation, my objective was to show the resistance to the internal and the external slave trade and to point out who the people are involved in the internal and the external slave trade. You need to remember the Balanta people. You need to remember the Djola people, the Baga people, the Balum people. These people chose not to deal with the European and forms of trade. They wanted to deal with their own indigenous culture and they had to be forced to migrate to the coast where many of us came from. So when you ask for a win and say, oh, you guys just got beat up, they just came over there and they just took you, understand we are fighting Africans. We are fighting people who are Europeans and we're fighting Muslim backed communities that are getting financed from the Near East with guns, etc. But these people, the Balanta, they remained victorious. So these are just some, which is not all, of the decentralized Africans who fought against the internal and external slave trade. I say peace. MBK is out. Rob Bone.